three. Seeing none. Okay. Chairperson Humphreys. Mm -hmm. I move that this committee uh, approves the FY 2022 and 23 budget for the state library. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Wolfmore. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Chairperson Humphreys. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're now going to look at the um, State Historical Society. Okay, the agency estimates total expenditures of $7.9 million, including $4.3 million is in is SGF. The revised estimate is an all funds increase of 879487 or 12.5%, and an SGF decrease of $6,497 or 0.2% from the approved amount. The revised estimate includes capital improvement expenditures of $1.1 million, including $450,000 SGF. The revised estimate is an all funds increase of $457,000. Uh, 1,500 or 7.9 percent above the approved amount. The F SGF amount is the same as the S F sorry SGF amount in the approved budget. The all funds increase is due to increased private gifts for their capital expenditures, um, and they uh, made repairs for the concrete walkways outside of the museum. I don't know if y'all saw those pictures last year. They replaced the floor uh, in the lobby. Uh, the revised estimate includes 85.5 FT positions, which is the same. The governor concurred with the agency's recommendation. Now, our committee concurred with the governor's recommendation, but we made the following adjustment. We deleted 14.5 FTE positions to bring the total number to 71 FTE positions in FY 2022. This is the same as FY 2023, so just so you know. And I, and I want to explain that because it seems very drastic. Right now, the, the Kansas State Historical Society has funded 63 positions. That's what their funding is, is 63 positions. They have about, I think it was 58 FTEs right now, but we're funding 63. So there's all of those that are in there that are not funded. Now, the director expressed to us that they have 58 employees right now. We funded up to 63. She would like to fund maybe eight more than that. So that's 71. That's where we got to the 71. So we are funding up to 71 positions right now. I mean, that's what this would be in, in uh, that's what her request is. That's what we're saying, even though only 63 are funded. The, the 85, the purpose of the committee, which was bipartisan in the committee when we voted, was just to say, let's be transparent. There's really not 85 working there. There's not 85 funding there. Let's try to say, what it actually is and what they actually want. The director was, her words were, I can live with this. And so that's why just out of transparency, we're trying to say what it is. Yes, he is. And so that's why it seems drastic, but really it's even more, we're not taking any funding away. Okay, I'll see if he can come over. Does he need to come over now? Whenever he can. Okay, Okay. All so right. that sounds right. personal instead of business. Okay. So that is why we have that. So I will stand for questions. What? Oh. All right. I do have a, I have a yeah, question. In sure. regards to the capital expenditures. Yes. Improvement expenditures. Mm -hmm. They're asking for $1.1 million, but only 450000 is defined for the repairs and the replacement at the Kansas Museum of History. Where is the other uh, 650000 It's private gifts. Asked, but what are they um, planning on doing has, with that oh, as far as capital improvements? Well, they're, they're doing a whole rework water. of the museum. And you um, can come over and switch could out we water. Mute the individual water. that's on WebEx. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Didn't sound like Brenda to me. All right. Proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Sorry, what did you just say? So these, these are the Okay, yep. So um, the headquarters, they're doing a rework on. The museum is, they're going to rework all of the exhibits. And they're going to close for a certain period of time also so that they can get that done. Well, I'm glad you, you pointed that out because that was, that was my next question. Mm -hmm. Is Because of the Kansas Museum, first time I attended that was in 1991. And since I've been there in other years... The exhibits hasn't changed okay, since well, 1991 when I went there the first time. They're doing a complete rework over that. Right. And it's going to... Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I realize that. But you can, have, you can update the exhibits because the history of the state of Kansas changes in over 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. All right. Sorry about that, Chairperson okay. Humphreys. So that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Chairperson Humphreys? All right, seeing none, you may move on Mr. to 2023. Chairman. Okay, thank Mr. you. Chairman. Okay, Mr. for 2023, Chairman. the agency requests expenditures of $7.3 million, including $4.5 million SGF. This is an all funds decrease of $586,532, or 7.4%. And an F SGF increase of 264,313, or 6.2%. This includes an enhancement request of $453,867 all SGF for operations in support of new exhibits at the Kansas Museum of History. New exhibits at the Kansas Museum of History, Mr. Chairman. The decrease in expenditures is related to reduced collection of fees due to COVID-19 pandemic and federal funds. Uh, the request includes capital improvement expenditures of $412, $800, including $250,000, $250, SGF for fiscal year 2023. This is an all funds decrease of $644,700 or 61% and an SGF decrease of $200,000. The decrease is due to the completion of multiple projects, the sidewalk out front and the floor in the lobby, including repairs, those repairs at the Museum of History. The request includes 85.5 FT positions. That's their request. The governor recommends expenditures of 7.5 million, including 4.7 million SGF. It's an F SGF increase of $125,000 above the agency's fiscal 2023 request. The recommendation includes capital improvement expenditures of $537,800, including 375 SGF for fiscal year 2023. That increase is 125,000 above the request is due to the governor's recommendation that the annual SGF support for rehabilitation and repair at state historic sites increase by 125,000. And then it's got the 85 FTEs. The budget, our budget committee concurred with the governor's recommendation with the following adjustment, delete 14.5 FTE positions to bring the total number to 71. For FY 2023, same explanation as far as the FTE goes. And I'll stand for questions. All right, thank you, Chairperson Humphreys. Um, so, what the $125,000 increase from the governor's budget is to repair state historical sites. So what would, is that just beyond the Kansas Museum of History or is what other sites would that be? So it, it's in the rehab and repair section uh, of their capital improvements. So, do, do we know if it was just, it was mostly for the museum or? No, it's, it's just a general increase. Um, yeah, it's just a general increase because of the age of buildings and things that need to be done. Okay, but we, we don't know specifically what We don't was. know. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and then I guess reverting back to my previous question, <laughs> um, since the, it, the, basically the exhibits hasn't changed since 1991 when I first attended. Do we have um, any traffic numbers at the Kansas Museum of History? 
Uh, that is a great question. We don't have the traffic numbers. We know during COVID they were closed for a long time and it was really some, it, it reduced their fees. And then now they're gonna do this reworking and they're gonna be closed for a certain period of time. At the, we're talking about at the museum. Um, and uh, I think the hope is that when this is all done, we go back to you know even exceeding numbers. Now, during that reworking, there's a lot, they have to take down those exhibits from 1991. And there's a lot of archiving, you know, so we did question, you know, the, what are, is everyone gonna be doing? And part of it was just carefully taking those exhibits, archiving them, doing the right thing, and then building all the new exhibits and different things and getting that all settled. So as far as traffic goes, it's been low. It will continue to be that way because of the close, but then we hope to have a great museum after that. Right. And then I mean, you may yep. not have an answer for this okay. question, but I just kind of want to Maybe. make this statement. Well, but I will ask Martin. He's a <laughs> Does the Kansas Historical Society expend any money to the Walter P. Chrysler Boyhood Home in Ellis? Mm. Wow, that is a very specific question. <laughs> I don't know if Representative Rogers may know that because that's in his district. But. I don't think so, right? But they're eligible for grants and tax credits. Okay. I mean, just in our area of the state, uh -huh. I mean, I think we should. Um, he was a very prominent individual from the state of Kansas, obviously became one of the three biggest automakers in the world. And I don't think we do enough to promote the success of Walter P. Chrysler. And that's why I bring that question up because not only did I work for the corporation, mm. um, but he was, a, he was a Kansan. Yeah. He was born and raised in the state of Kansas. And like I said, he created one of the three biggest automakers in the world. And I don't think the state does enough to promote his success. And that's why I bring that question up. I would agree. I've lived in Kansas 40 years and I did not know that he was from Kansas. So <laughs> he was raised there you in go. Ellis, That's Kansas. your point. <laughs> um, Representative Landwehr, I believe you have a question on WebEx. I think, I think yeah, Ms. thank you, Mr. Chairman. It actually goes back to the, the first budget she was talking about is so we are rechanging the, the uh, shrinkage rate for that agency. The what rate? We turn up the volume. We can barely hear Representative Landwehr. Are we changing the shrinkage rate on that first budget you had? Chairperson Humphreys? We're not changing the budget at all. Shrinkage rate. Shrinkage rate, okay. Okay. <laughs> Representative, we don't think so. I thought I heard, yeah, I thought I heard going from like 83 to 71 or something like that. Chairperson. Yes, because, and, and I'm not sure if you heard right now, uh, there's around, is it 56 or 58? Employees, current employees. We are funding 63 positions. But the budget says 85.5. And so we're just bringing it down to the level that the director has said she would like to hire up to. Which is 14 more positions that we have now, 71. We're, we're taking off 14.5 FTEs, but not so changing the budget. It's a trans, I, for me, it's a transparency. This is what's actually happening. This is what we actually, this is what they're requesting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just have to look at it because I'm, I think that is a shrinkage rate change if I understand correctly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would like to learn more about that too, Representative. Thank you. All right, uh, Representative Woodard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I thank you to the chair. She did a great job explaining the budget. Um, I do. This was one of the agencies that did take the full 10% uh, reduced resources cut. And so part of that is getting back up to where they were. Um, I, I appreciate the agency's agreement to compromise with the committee with at the FT positions that were approved. Um, I do believe that after the renovation and new exhibits opening, we should expect a future ask for an increase in FTE positions. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Corbett. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. One of the questions I'd have for you is I think she said she testified maybe last year they'd be closing for a year or for whatever it was for updates. But it also would be nice to know what the, what the attendees, the traffic, maybe where they're from over the last five or six years. Because I think sometimes, not just the museums, but tourism and state agencies and wildlife and parks, they get paid the same whether there's any traffic or not. And uh, we'd kind of like to know if the dollars we were spending are bringing people in and, and if we, what we can do to make things better for everything. So that's just a comment. Representative Williams. We were just chatting over here about the shrinkage rate. So you do have, you have a gap of, you have 58 that are filled and you're giving it, instead of 85, you're saying that that shrinkage rate, we're gonna move it down to 71. So you have eight open, correct? Yeah. So then there's- 63. 60, 63 is, oh. is what we have funded at this point. Okay. And so it's eight more than the 63. Okay, so eight more than that, then that would be the shrinkage rate, then that would be that flux that you have between what you actually have and what you, they can have. So most budgets are between, I don't know, five and 15% or so. And so you're, you're just saying you're bringing that shrinkage rate down. Yes. Okay. So that, that might help Brenda, Representative okay. Landwehr. Okay. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just trying to get a handle on some of the change. And one of my questions was on the employee number, which I think we have uh, uh, hit pretty hard. But I was looking at the change. If I look on page four, um, it sounded like our change was funding these um, renovations and giving the chair some new uh, exhibits. But when I, I look at the salary and wage line, that seems to be where the increase is. So is that accounted for in salaries and wages? Am I hiring people to do that versus expending things on concrete and other types of things and that the capital outlay and commodities figures don't change? Okay. Yep, so great, great catch there. The, um, right now we're funding 63 positions. That extra is funding those eight extra positions. The, okay. in the salaries and wages line for 2023. So if I fund the extra positions to account for the variance that is there, mm -hmm. where do I come up with the money to do the capital improvement expenditures of 537, I guess that's thousand? So, um, because there's something about the exhibits that I was working and doing some some changing on. I was trying to get a handle on. Okay, sorry. Let me just. And where are you looking? You're looking on the blue sheet on that one. So there, I was looking at when we were talking about the increase from the summary. We seem to be talking about changing some of the exhibits in 23. Was that accurate? That we were doing some changes and. Chairperson Humphreys. Yes, thank you. One sec. I think we were talking about doing some changes, right? We don't have any funding in there. It's part of phoning a friend. Just one second. If you would look on page nine, and the new exhibits at the Kansas Museum of History, there's part of it is funding some of the extra uh, positions, document preparers, maintenance worker, application developer, museum curator. So those things, these are positions, do, do you see that, the uh, enhancement request? So it, the, the positions have to do with 
the um, support of the new exhibits. Okay, so I'm not actually doing the capital improvements. I'm, I'm doing it through the, the people working within the existing structure exactly. to make that, mm -hmm. that all work. Yep. So, so thank you. Thanks for mm -hmm. the clarification. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was looking at the, uh, on, I'm on 2023 right now, uh, the enhanced request of $453,000, eight, wait, no, $453,867. I find that oddly specific. Um, I would assume from that that we know what we're purchasing already and know the price or was... Okay, those are, um, again, if you look on page nine, the enhancement request. Right, so there's that. eight positions. That's $414,267. Commodities, 34550 And Humanities, Kansas, 5050 So that's where you get the $453,867. So, so we're not actually having new history, as the chair would like to see, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're seeing salary and wage increase. In this budget, yes, that's right. So are we really getting new new history or or not? <laughs> There's no such thing as a new history. I know that. Yes, I'm so just giving you <laughs> History's history. No, displays. New displays that explain the same history. <laughs> Excellent. And where is where is that line item? Is that the commodities? We're getting thirty four thousand dollars worth of new history explanation. My understanding. It's not what? Second. It's I know it's not that, but where where is that money coming from? With the new? I don't think we have a special line. Item. Okay, we don't have a special line item yet for that, but I think a lot of it is going to be private gifts. Is what the. <laughs> Yes, that's, yes. Private that, gifts is where the majority of it's going to come from. And that's where I was looking for an all funds increase, and I didn't see it. Well, we're not purchasing the new history, exhib the new history, <laughs> the new exhibits of the same history in this budget. Gotcha. All right, that answers my question. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you, you for Mr. clarifying. Chair. Representative Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I look forward to more debate on budgets that are over a billion dollars yet again we spend many times on on minutia um i don't have a question but the historical society is more than that museum out in the west end of town and i i look forward i met the new tourism director i look forward to talk about tourism and we can talk about that if we don't know our history we're doomed to repeat it and you know, we have what we need archivists. We have boxes of stuff that can't be archived because of COVID and shutdowns. You know, we, we run around this building, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel. Those answers may be in those boxes somewhere. So of all the things that we fund as what I think is an essential, uh, essential part of state government is our history. You know, the chairman talked about Walter Chrysler there's a guy that grew up about seven miles from where I live that was the author of the Hatch Act. We have the guy that, you know, was the cartoonist for Porky Pig that I drive by that little deal every day and every time I go by Portis, Kansas. I don't know, you know, what do those mean? Not much, but it's part of our history. And all the stuff that we do as a legislature and, and everything else and those that, that contribute. So, I mean, I, I think it's great to have fun. And then, by the way, I, I enjoy those exhibits. I'm going to be curious of what's going to be left at that museum because a lot of the ones I like because I always seem to learn something every time I go out there. But I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just saying, you know, I, I don't want us to get caught up on, on, you know, what goes on out, you know, at the museum. That, that's one, just one part of it. But of all the things we fund, I, I think the historical society is – you know, is critical. So much that we focus so much on the now. You know, I always say around here, we always, we have that get me to Thursday philosophy. If we can just get to the end of Thursday, then we can have a break and, and go to attack it again. But 
we do. We have such a rich history in the state. And that's where, as, as we look at whether it's one-time money through Spark or, or, or just consistent. And, you know, hats off to the director for being a team player. And, and you know, which was a bit, you know, his, history goes on. You know, every day we, we close the book on, on one day and that's part of history. And so I think if, if we can, if I can do anything is just, just keep that in the back of our minds as we move forward. You know, the historical society is, is, they're the record keepers of what we do. We as Kansans. But also keep in mind, we as a legislature um, want our kids to learn Kansas history. And guess who does that? Guess who provides the tools and the, the, the information to teach our kids Kansas history? It's right here. It's a historical society. So as we move forward, let's, let's you know, I guess, you know, I just want to keep that in mind. The, the chairman has done a great job on this, and I, and I appreciate what they've tried to do to bring transparency and, and, and really an honesty of where we are with employees instead of, you know, trying to pack it and, and maybe do some, some budget uh, sorcery, if you will. That's maybe a bad word to use. But, but, but the bottom line is, you know, and, and, I, I, and I apologize for digressing, Mr. Chairman, but this is important. The historical society is very important, and, uh, but, but, it, but it affects every one of our counties, every one of our constituents. And so I strongly encourage what we can do here, maybe even in, in Omnibus, if we can enhance that more to speed up that process. Because every day that goes by, you know, is, is, is another day lost of, of archiving what we've done. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, but I would like to make... Oh, Representative Ballard? No, I just raised my hand when you were looking the other way. I just want, just for clarification. Yes. When you indicated that they had 85 positions, those were approved positions, right, but not all totally funded. And I think yes. I don't want that to get lost in it because those were what were approved because we can't have a program unless we go through that channel of getting approved. So you had 85 approved, mm -hmm. but actually you only funded 63. And now with the new one coming on, you're adding eight. I mean, yes. 71, mm -hmm. yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to make sure because the question was, well, I, well, do we get the money back? Well, no, we never got money for those positions. Those were the ones that were approved. So in case you needed them, you had them available because it takes a while to get them approved. And sometimes we can't wait that long. Well said. Good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any further questions? And I would just like to, oh, Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and sorry to continue, but thanks for pointing out the detail on page nine. Mm -hmm. But it looks as I look at the positions that are there, and I don't know that it's right or wrong, but it looks more like an ongoing piece than for a project to update the current year. Is, is that correct? So I would expect this to keep going rather than be a one-year increase to <laughs> accomplish these projects. I think the 71 is ongoing, yes. 71. 71 FTEs so is an we'll be, ongoing, not a one-time. So we would expect we were now funding 63 yes. with this budget, and we would expect to go from 63 to 71 going forward. That's what we have, yes. Okay. At this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Williams. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. So when we look at the list, the historian, the exhibit script writer, the museum curator, the mu museum administrator, we didn't have that before. So what was in the 58 FTE positions? And now we're adding these. And then they're not really open to the public during the renovation. So you've got 58. What are those 58 employees doing while you're not open to the public, but you're adding eight more? It, it's just a little confusing, and I'm surprised they don't have some of these things already. Yep. So they have lost employees was part of it. And I think that's a great question. We could probably get some more information about that. I know, uh, you know, we ask about that somewhat in the committee. And, you know, we didn't get a breakdown of all the 58 that are employed right now. The director indicated that they have lost maintenance people a lot. They've lost people that are answering the phones. They've, you know, that they, a lot of the positions from what I understand are actually dealing with 
the documents and the archivists and different things like that, and getting information out to the state. I think we could ask for a more detailed explanation of that, which would be helpful. I, well, and I, I guess my point on that is that in that original number, you would have thought that that would have been included. I mean, so, but these are additional on top of. So it's not like we're just having to replace people that quit in the 50 states. So these are, I mean, again, as Representative Ballard mentioned, they were approved for uh, 85 positions. So they had those, I'm, they had those positions laid out. So, but they're not, they're not putting, slotting people in all of those positions. These are some of the ones that they feel like they need to have now. Well, so that's where the 71 comes in. I, more information is always helpful, so I'm not at all opposed to getting Nobody's more. opposed to history, but I think it's just the idea of making sure we're funding the salary is at appropriate level, what, especially considering that we're going through a period of, well, cl potential closure or reduced hours so that you can update all of this. So it, I, I guess for me, I, I don't un understand the budget. Thank you. Representative Woodard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just going to back up my chair for a moment. Uh, this is one of the agencies that did take a full 10% reduced resource budget. Uh, as you can see from their budget, the majority of their budget does come from salaries. So through attrition, they did eliminate positions to meet that 10% cut. This is getting them back to where they were before the pandemic. Okay. May Is that I answer? a question or just a statement? That was a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. So no need for an answer. Okay. Any other questions or comments in regards to the Kansas State Historical Society? I just kind of wanted to um, dovetail off of Representative Rogers' comments before. We do have a very prominent history in the state of Kansas. Um, we have local museums that try to promote the um, historical figures um, from across the state of Kansas. Obviously, I think everybody knows that I'm from a very small community in central Kansas, and one of those individuals was Mother Bickerdyke. And very few probably understand what the history of Mother Bickerdyke was, but she was a very prominent Civil War nurse um, that actually lived in Bunker Hill, Kansas. And, uh, and the museum in Bunker Hill, Kansas tries to promote her life. Uh, I focus on Walter P. Chrysler because, uh, as I mentioned before, he ended up creating one of the three largest automobile companies in the world, but we don't promote it as much. And maybe that's just the, the being humble as Kansans. We don't uh, promote exactly what Kansans have done. Um, another example would be uh, Russell Stover was born in Osborne County and very few know that Russell Stover was born in Kansas. And if you tour the vault, I would say the vault, at the Kansas History Museum, you will see artifacts from all aspects of the history of Kansas that are not <clears throat> being exhibited at the museum. For example, Ed Asner was born in Kansas City, Kansas. And the desk that was on the Mary Tyler Moore show is in that vault. So. There are a lot of things that we can promote, and I've been trying to do that in regards to Walter P. Chrysler, either the museum in Ellis or the Kansas History Museum. I've reached out to the contacts that I have with now Fiat Chrysler because there is a museum in Michigan promoting the life of Walter P. Chrysler, and I've been trying to work with the Kansas Historical Society on getting some of those artifacts to the state of Kansas to promote the life of one of our prominent citizens. Um, so that's the comment. I, I just kind of wanted to touch base on that with what Representative Rogers says. Is we have a very prominent history in this state. We have very prominent historical figures, and I think we need to embrace that. And, and when this renovation goes with the Kansas History Museum, I hope we focus on those individuals that came from the state of Kansas, did prominent things in the nation and the world, and be proud of those Kansans that contributed to, um, to our world. So I just wanted to make that comment. All right, Susan, or Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may rep, uh, respond to Representative Corbett, that I, I think we could get that information. Can we get the information of uh, 
all the admissions and numbers and things like that. Okay, they're going to work on that. Thank you for that. Representative Rogers, well said. Thank you for your comments and also Chairman. Thank you for those comments and also the good questions, which more information is always helpful trying to understand where we get our numbers. So thank you for that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Appropriations Committee accept the budget report for the State Historical Society for FY22 and 23. Right, committee, you heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative Rogers. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Chairperson Humphreys. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to an update with the Kansas Public Employees Retirement System. So right now, I would invite the Executive Director, Alan Conroy, to the committee. Welcome to the committee, Executive Director. Good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I think we've got a PowerPoint presentation for you. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to move along. Pretty good clip, particularly there's... Fine. <laughs> There's kind of five uh, topics I think you'd requested to uh, to address, and I'm going to focus, go touch on them all, but just brief um, focus on the last, particularly the last two, which are the items that might uh, come before uh, this committee this this session in particular, and um, and certainly. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, certainly pleased to share the information about CAPERS. I've got some uh, good help here. Trustee uh, Ernie Claudel from Olathe and Trustee Ryan Trader, also from Olathe, are here. Um, should you have any uh, hard questions, uh, that's what they're here for. So um, just to remind you, CAPERS, um, uh, you know, is a large system, over uh, 300,000 uh, members, um, and there's those three retirement system regular CAPERS, which is state, local, school, um, police and fire, and, and the judges system. And we work with over 1,500 employers, state of Kansas, all the school districts, all the counties, almost all the cities, and, and then lots of other uh, townships and community colleges and conservation districts and, and other uh, public organizations like that. Uh, we're governed by a, a nine-member board of trustees, uh, and they're listed on in page three, Four appointed by the governor, one by the Speaker of the House, one by the President of the Senate. Members get to elect two, and then the state treasurer is on by virtue uh, of, of the office. On slide four, then, are just those topics. Briefly, uh, going to touch on the 2021 investment returns. Great news. Uh, pension funding bonds, also, I think, great news, at least at this point. I'll let you know the board's looking at the investment return assumption, and then talk about that, the governor's recommendation for moving CAPERS correctional staff and wildlife and parks to, to uh, police and fire. And then uh, also a topic that uh, has been some discussion about some additional contributions to, to CAPERS to pay the unfunded actuarial liability. On slide five, just to remind you, this is the, the good news. On slide five, uh, fiscal year 21, so last uh, June, uh, the rate of return that we earned on that was 26.3%. I wish we could do that uh, every year, but unfortunately we probably uh, won't, but it was a great, a great year, um, and that, uh, those additional earnings then help uh, shore up uh, the, the trust fund and the funding soundness of the system. And as you can see there, over half comes of Revenue into the trust fund comes from investments, about a third from employer contributions, and the balance from members. And you can see the uh, this is a time-weighted return since last June, and that little dotted line is our current assumed rate of return, 7.75%. You look back over the last 25 years, and we've earned uh, 8%. Slide 6 uh, just breaks it down by... Uh, uh, fiscal year, those returns, that 26.3 out there, but as you, as you see across uh, back to 1998, there have been some very good years and some not so good years, uh, 2008, 2009, for example, 2000, around 2001 um, also uh, were down years. Again, that dotted line is that assumed rate, rate of return. Um, slide seven just uh, summarizes then, and this was the last actual data that, data that we shared with the board, but uh, that 25-year return there is 7.9. Last 10 years is 10.2%. Uh, 
Um, changing gear then on slide eight, pension funding bonds. Uh, you may remember last session, the legislature approved a half billion dollars in pension funding bonds, 30-year uh, bonds. They were sold in August at a rate of 2.65%. So a very, very favorable uh, rate, I guess, if you're um, selling, selling those bonds. Um, that money flowed to the, to the trust fund. Uh, it improved the funded ratio of the state school group. Starts with the school group, but then ultimately state school group by about 2.3%. Uh, uh, and as you probably remember, uh, these pension funding bonds are nothing more than interest arbitrage bonds. It just assumes that uh, you all will sell the bonds, the state will sell, pay the debt service on it, um, CAPERS will receive the money, and over time will be able to outperform, in this case, 2.65%. And that means then the trust fund is stronger, which ultimately means less employer contributions uh, by, by the state. Uh, particularly for the state state school group, but on the on those thirty year bonds uh, you 'll have to pay annual debt service of twenty four million a year, presumably for the state general fund um, on those bonds. Uh, on slide nine is just the quick history of uh, it 's been done twice before uh, in terms of pension funding bonds in two thousand and four the state sold uh, a half billion dollars in bonds, and those sold at a rate of 5.39%. Um, and we ultimately, because of the way it was financed, we got a net of 440 million on those bonds. You all are paying 33 million a year um, out of the Expanded Lottery Act Revenues Fund for that debt service, again, 30-year bonds. And then in 2015, the legislature authorized a billion dollars in bonds. We got the billion. Those sold for 4.69%. You're paying annual debt service of six, 65 million. So uh, just to recap here, just pause. So you're paying 33 million on the 2004 bonds, you're paying 65 million on the 2015, and you're gonna pay 24 million uh, on the, the most recent bonds in, in 2001. So that's $122 million of debt service states paying. It's not coming to CAPERS. It's in over, I think, in the Department of Administration's budget, so it shows up there. But it's actually, it's really a state commitment to help fund CAPERS, that annual debt, debt service payments. Slide 10 just looks at the, uh, uh, the how it's done. And again, they're 30-year bonds. And so uh, those 2004 bonds, um, uh, the, on what we've earned on those in that time period uh, is a little over 8%. So uh, we've on the on that money we received we've earned we got 440 million and so far we've earned 624 million, so not a bad deal. But again, they're 30-year bonds, and clearly things will change uh, over the com coming coming years, and maybe even this month as we watch the market a little bit. Um, uh, as we look, the 2015 we've earned 9.5 percent on those. So you gave us a billion. So far we've earned. 436 million on those bonds, and of course, way shorter uh, t time period. So you put all that uh, together on the bottom of slide uh, 11 is, so kind of what's the net position on the f pension funding bonds? So you've given us the money, you're paying the debt service, and if you take that debt service payments out of what we've earned, we're currently a net good uh, positive by a billion dollars on that money. So it's worked exactly as it was hoped, but again, they're 30 year bonds and we'll, we'll you know, check back in five years and 10 years, but um, certainly at this point, they worked uh, exactly as in, intended. Slide 12, uh, changing gears here. The board is currently looking at that uh, investment return assumption, and that's an important, it's probably one of the, uh, really the key uh, assumptions that the board uh, deals with. It says, what, what do they think that the board, that the trust fund will earn in the coming years. It's currently at 7.75%, but it's one of the, it is probably one of the key factors in terms of then uh, calculating uh, liabilities. Because you, again, we know right now over half the money comes off those investment earnings. And so as we project out things, what's that assumed interest rate going to be, earnings going to be on, on the trust fund, and it's currently at 7.75. On slide 13 then, again, that's a delegated authority that the legislature gave the Board of Trustees. Um, 
uh, was, uh, it had been at 8% for a long time. In 2016, uh, it was lowered from 8% down to 775. Um, and, and so, and you may think kind of why that's important to have a, a, an accurate number or best guess, I guess. It's because you want to get the, so there's intergenerational equity as it's called. So to make sure the current employers are paying the right rate and, and if, it's, or if it's too low, then uh, uh, liabilities will get shifted to f uh, future employers and vice versa, if they're overpay, if you're overpaying now, then future employers uh, would would have to pay less. So it's just trying to get that uh, intergenerational equity between uh, what we think we'll earn, and when you're projecting on 26 billion dollars out over 50 years, each quarter of a percent makes makes a big 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 difference. Um, I will on slide 14 just point out, of course. Um, last time when the board looked at it in 2019, uh, the investment consultants, their 10-year horizon, and of course this is actual, uh, is different, longer time horizon, but they were around, uh, around seven, low 7%. Seven They've now come back, uh, you ask those same consultants, and they think it's going to be around 6%. So, and a lot of the public pension plans around, across the country uh, have lowered their assumed rate of return, and so the board's currently studying that and, and is currently gathering uh, information on that, but just want to make you aware of that. Slide 15 uh, changes then uh, uh, subjects again, police and fire coverage for uh, correctional officers and wildlife and park law enforcement officers. Um, uh, CAPERS correctional officers are uh, currently in uh, really CAPERS uh, 2, or it's a subgroup of CAPERS 2, CAPERS correctional. Uh, you'll see on that box on slide 15, uh, CAPERS 2 for normal retirement. It's age 60 with 30 years, 65 and 5. CAPERS correctional, uh, the group A, uh, and those are for security officers. They currently can retire at age 55 with 10 years. And there's a group B, those are uh, non-correctional officers, but people that have uh, daily contact with inmates like food service and so forth, uh, maintenance. Um, those have a normal retirement date of age 60 uh, with, with 10, 10 years of, of service. Um, and, and so if you look to slide 16, is just kind of a comparison. Um, vesting periods shorter in CAPERS correctional, uh, uh, five years as it is for regular CAPERS, uh, where the wildlife and park officers would be there in CAPERS 3. Uh, KPNF, it's 15 years. The employees contribute more under KPNF. Uh, the employer con uh, contributes uh, considerably more, around 14, 15 percent um, for the CAPERS correctional, about 23 percent currently for uh, police, police and fire. Mention uh, CAPERS, uh, uh, Social Security coverage. Both of these uh, groups, of course, are in Social Security now. And Social Security, of course, the way it works, once you're in, you're always going to stay in. So even if these individuals get transferred to police and fire, uh, the employer, the member, will still participate in Social Security. So that'd be additional cost uh, on, on that. There are uh, Highway Patrol troopers, KBI agents, Back in the 60s, early 70s, the decision was made to not have them affiliate with Social Security, so they don't have Social Security coverage for their state uh, state employment. Um, and then police and fire, probably the two biggest differences is that benefit uh, formula. You know, the three things in terms that ultimately de uh, determine a person's retirement benefit, final average salary, years of service, uh, and the multiplier. Capers Correctional, it's 185. Police and Fire, it's 2.5. And then that normal retirement mentioned Capers Correctional, but for Police and Fire, it can be age 50 with 25 years, age 55 with 20 years, or age 60 with 15 years. Slide um, 17 then just talks a little bit about the contribution increase. So the employee's contribution will go from 6 to 715. It's approved um, based on a uh, $40,000 a year salary, just as an example, that's about a $460 uh, increase there. 
The employer contribution, again, going from that 13% to about 23%, that's about a $4,000 increase on that uh, $40,000 salary. And again, vesting period takes longer, that multiplier's benefit, and disability's uh, a little less restrictive in police and fire than it is in regular capers. Um, just on slide 18, just uh, in terms of should the change happen then, um, uh, when a member moves from CAPERS to KPNF for future service, their CAPERS service doesn't convert into that KPNF service. So if a member has, let's say, five years in CAPERS, they need to get to 15 years to vest and reti be retirement eligible, uh, to have a lifetime benefit in KPNF, um, they they can count those five years to get to the 15, but whenever they retire, they'll still get five year, a benefit of five years on their CAPER service, and in that example, 10 years in police, police and fire. So they, uh, they'll ultimately get two different, different uh, b benefits, one from CAPERS, one from KPNF. Just note, uh, sometimes, uh, th th I think it's important, so if a person has CAPER service and they're vested, so let's say they work the five years, they get transferred to police and fire, but if they leave police and fire before their 15 years, they're only gonna get the benefit for the five years under CAPERS, and then their contributions in KPNF, maybe they stayed you know, three years and decided to go do something else, they would just get their KPNF, their contributions back plus interest, uh, but they'd just get a retirement benefit based on that five, five years of, of Capers. Um, on the cost, on 19, um, we're still working uh, with the actuary to get a specific cost, but last year there was a sort of a similar bill looking at the Capers Correctional, and the annual cost there was about six six million million dollars um, annually uh, in those increased employer contributions. Okay, then switching to the last gear, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, payment of those delayed uh, employer contributions. The governor had recommended, has recommended about $254 uh, million in her budget to pay the remaining amounts on delayed state school employer contributions from 2017 and 2019. Uh, th there were some budget difficulties at the time and the decision was made in 2017 that 64 million could not be paid. In 2019, 194 million couldn't be paid. But the, the, I think the policymakers at the time trying to do what they could to help continue improve the funding position of CAPERS decided can't pay you now, but we'll pay you over the next 20 years. And so there's, they're called layering payments. So it's about $25 million a year. The state's currently paid CAPERS for those uh, delayed, delayed payments. The one little wrinkle uh, in this, since it's in the law that that uh, the state will pay CAPERS this $25 million a year, our actuary has already factored that payment in as a, as a, uh, as a receivable on the actuarial side. So if the money, if those payments get paid off, it's not gonna reduce the unfunded actuarial liability, it's not gonna improve the funded ratio because the actuary's already assumed because that's what the law says, you're gonna pay it and I know you'd never not pay it, uh, but, um, but that's what the law provides, and so it's counted, it's booked as a receivable, and, and so the money's already, in effect, been uh, account, accounted for. Um, and so um, on slide 21, then, is just a little couple little tables that shows that you <clears throat> um, started out uh, that the... Uh, the remaining balance uh, on those layering payments is about $425 million. Uh, if you go ahead and pay it off now, uh, at $254 million, so it saves you that $25 million a year on, the, on your budget side, and so that difference then is a savings over the full length of $172 million in savings to the state um, by, by prepaying uh, those layering, layering payments off. And then on uh, slide uh, 22, it just talks about just additional payments to CAPERS, um, and that's what makes uh, always interesting to come to the Capitol building, that there'd be lots of discussion about extra money coming towards CAPERS, um, and certainly we're <laughs> pleased to, to hear that. Um, uh, and, and so, of course, any additional payments then um, would, uh, you know, reduce 
the unfunded actuary liability. It would reduce uh, the employer contributions. Uh, it would improve the, the fund funded uh, ratio. And so uh, on slide 23, uh, there's just some, you know, there have been discussions about additional 450 million or 500 million or 575 million or maybe a billion. And so, and it's not really linear, but just as a rough estimate then, um, uh, as we look to, uh, you, you know, the, to the funded ratio, and that's assets to liability, you want to be 100% funded, but uh, you want to at least be over 80% funded, because uh, then whenever the downturn, the next downturn comes in the stock market, the system can take that shock uh, and still be on sound, sound footing. And so each $100 million additional funding would improve that funded ratio about four-tenths of a percent. Uh, the decrease in those annual employer contributions, about $7.5 million per $100 uh, million. Um, and, and so, and then whatever the dollar contribution is, that's how much the unfunded liability it, uh, go down. And there's a bill, in fact, uh, House Bill 2561, which was just heard yesterday in Pensions and Insurance uh, Committee, that it was a billion dollars. It would pay off those layering payments, that $254 million that the governor's recommended, and then the balance, $746 million, would be additional uh, co contributions. And slide four kind of capital capsulizes that. So again, the $254 million's already been accounted for uh, it, it, by the actuary, so that means 746 million then would be reduced in the unfunded actuary liability, improve that funded ratio of 3.4 percent, which if you read the fine print there, it gets us over 80 percent. So it'd be that hurdle, that last important hurdle, still on our way to get to 100 percent funded, but to get us over um, 80 percent. And then on kind of the state budget side, so you under uh, this scenario, House Bill 2561, you wouldn't have to make that $25 million layering payment. The employer contribution rates would go down for this payment of 746. So that saves you, in terms of the state budget, about $80 million a year that, that you wouldn't have to send uh, to CAPERS. Um, and so over the five years, it would save, in terms on budgetary savings, uh, $429 million. million. So. Uh, <laughs> tried to cover lots of information there, but certainly pleased to respond to questions at the appropriate time or some other time if you need to press on. All right. Thank you, Director Conroy, and, and thank you for the latter part of your presentation because there's been a lot of discussion in regards to what we could possibly do um, for CAPERS, and so I want to thank you for giving us a, an example of what those impacts would be for the state budget not only for this current fiscal year they're going to be talking about, but also five years out and what the cost savings would be if we were to put additional money into the unfunded liability and also um, possibly, as the governor has recommended in her budget, paying off the layering payment that we uh, put into place a few years ago. So I'll now open up for questions for Director Conroy. Uh, Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. This is a lot of uh, valuable information. Um, so you talked about the uh, corrections employee, or excuse me, the KPNF employee that uh, quits at 14 years, for instance, and they're not vested. So as we're talking about a transition, could one of the unintended consequences be, let's say you're a corrections officer for four years on the current uh, uh, CAPERS plan, you wouldn't be vested at that point when we switched to KPNF. So in essence, you could work for the state for 18 years, four years under the current K CAPERS, 14 years under KPNF, and you would only have the portion that you'd contributed? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, if you work the full 18 years, th then you'd be vested under KPNF because that's four years, even though you weren't vested, that's service credit that would transfer and apply towards that 15 years of, of of service. Would you get service. your matching for the four years from the state? You know how the state matches so much of what you contribute. Would you get that for the four years? Um, I think that's a good question because you would not be vested. Um, I, I'm thinking that'd be maybe the example the other way uh, of a person who was vested under CAPERS, didn't have enough time in, K, in KPNF and left, so they just get return of contributions. I think um, we may have to check that, but I think it might work uh, the other way. 
combined years. Okay, so Jared's uh, correcting me. So they would get their CAPERS credit uh, because then, because those years under KPNF would help them for vesting purposes, vest under regular CAPERS as well as uh, uh, KPNF. So, so the, the concern for corrections officers then, just so that I understand, if they went from the current system to that, if they didn't work for the state for the 15 years, that's when they would lose their vesting versus now, if they work for the state for five years, they've got some level of vesting. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Director Conroy? Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the report. And a couple things that I'd just check as we go forward. Forward on page 10 with the bonding, uh, excited for what we've done, but as we reported, it may be useful to know our outstanding or remaining principal balance on those bonds just to get a sense of our total debt while we shifted it to the balance sheet. Uh, I don't want to miss that that's still pension related debt. Yeah, a billion 150 on the bonds, not counting the ones that were just sold. So on the, the two kind of historical bonds, 2015 and 2004, there's a billion 150 still outstanding. Great, so a billion 150 and then the 500 that we just issued would be the total uh, that we have. So that's actually better than I had hoped it would be. Uh, so glad that's being paid down. Then as I look at the comparison between uh, Correctional 2 and KPNF, another part of the employer contribution might be, uh, we have social security on Correctional 2 and we do not have it on KPNF at the state level. Is that correct? Uh, on the state level, KPNF, it depends on, uh, I guess, when they came into to KPNF. So as I mentioned, troopers and KBI agents are not. But any of the more recent groups, uh, capital security, um, you know, fire marshal or firefighters out at Forbes, uh, regents police, those, since they were in Social Security, they remain in Social Security even though they've been transferred to police and fire. So as I change someone from an existing Social Security covered position because they must stay in Social Security, that benefit follows them in addition to the KPNF benefit that was initially set up. That's correct. So thank you. Uh, so it would be a mix on the KPNF side, but the additional employer contribution on the CAPERS correctional side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alan, for being here, and thank you for all the work you've done over the years. Um, first question, when was the last time we gave our um, CAPERS employees a cost of living raise or any kind of raise? Uh, for uh, CAPERS retirees, the last time there's been a benefit adjustment, um, anybody that's retired uh, since 1998 has not received uh, a benefit adjustment, cost of living adjustment uh, in their benefit. The, the 2007, 2000, yeah, I guess it was 2008 legislature made a benefit adjustment, but as a condition, the person had to be retired at least 10 years. So that gets you back to okay. 1998. So about 88% of our current retirees have not received a uh, cost of living adjustment. At some point, and I think we all know this, that money just doesn't keep pace with um, inflation and the cost of living. So uh, my next question, we've talked a lot about, you know, adding additional money for CAPERS and, you know, about the billion dollars and, you know, haven't really thought that one through yet. But what I am hearing a lot from constituents, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, um, they somehow, I think it's because of all our past problems with CAPERS and we weren't funding it and all those kind of issues that they somehow have in their minds that this a this billion dollars has to be funded or somehow it, CAPERS in terrible shape or, or there, it will somehow affect their benefit to the good or the bad whether we, and trying desperately to help with that information because in fact, you know, while it makes the fund healthier, in no way are our CAPERS employees at risk whether we do this or not. Maybe you could help a little just in case any are listening in. Right. Uh, you're, you're correct. It does not impact uh, the members' uh, benefits now or in, in the future. Um, you know, the, as a defined benefit plan, um, you know, we get the investment earnings, we get the employee earnings, and then the plug factor falls to the employers. So whatever's happening on the investment side, investments are down, the employer then is going to have to, to make that up. Um, but we're, you know, I think with a lot of effort 
from policymakers through the bonds. You know, CAPERS 3 was created, getting to the actuarially required rate for state school. It had been over 25 years since that had happened, so in the last four years, with a lot of heavy lifting, uh, that has happened, and that might be one of the key figures in terms of long-term sustainability in the system of having the employers, the state, pay the required amount, not only for all state employees, but all local school employees of state aid to education. And so, uh, but the funding, you know, we're in the 70% now. Back in 2012, you know, one of our low points, we were at 56%. Um, and so uh, a lot has, a lot of effort has gone on to improve us, to get us to 70, and now we're getting close to that. We can at least see the 80%. Um, so uh, uh, the, the billion dollar, really, you know, it's an obligation of the state. Um, you all collectively own it, lock, stock, and barrel. We're charging 7.75% and, and, uh, on, on that unfunded liability. Um, and it's not, you know, it's part of pension funding plan to have some unfunded actuary liability. There's just a handful of states that are uh, state plans that are 100% funded. So um, I, I, I am not worried about the ability to pay uh, benefits now or in the future. And, and of course, the stronger that funded ratio is, then it just increases that certainty. Sure, thank you very much. And by the way, I think the layering, cleaning up the layering payment, paying that off is a must because that is our obligation that we have missed. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Francis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me a second time. I always hate it when I use a big word because sometimes I think I know what it means and it doesn't, so get prepared, everybody. So, so I'm thinking about this retirement holistically, you know, trying to get out of the uh, silos of, of uh, CAPERS and Social Security. So, so as I'm thinking about what you presented on the comparison between CAPERS and KPNF, we currently, for the KPNF employees, the vast majority of the state employees, we pay about 22.8% for their retirement. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And also, for the uh, CAPERS Correctional too, we pay about 22% because I need to add back in the 7.65% or whatever for the uh, 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 Social Security. Uh, yes, that's right. And of course... Is that 1.65 is for on the Medicare side, and six there's six percent for the retirement side. Now the the KPNF guys also have to pay that then. Yeah. Um, so so as I'm thinking about this, our our existing employees that are on KPNF, the vast majority of them, we pay 22.8 percent for their retirement. If we make this transition of the uh, Capers employees to KPNF. If I look at it holistically as a total apple, I'll be paying about 29 or 30% towards their retirement. Would that? Yes, that'd be correct. Now, this is where I'm really going down a rabbit hole and I probably don't have the information to really make this assumption. When we talk about the comparative benefits of highway patrol and KBIs versus correction officers currently, I see that, um, um, KBI officers and highway patrol, if they work for 36 years, they get 90% of their final average salary. If uh, uh, a CAPERS officer gets 30 years of service, he gets 55.5%. You could at least make the rationalization, I don't know if it's correct, that, that their Social Security benefit at 62 or 65 could make up some of that gap in retirement income, at least. I would agree with that. And, and, and of course, that's the way CAPERS is designed. Regular CAPERS is in conjunction with Social Security, that it's CAPERS benefit plus the member's Social Security plus personal savings. So when we really look at the 55 to 90 percent, it may not be a fair comparison. Obviously, everybody's situation varies based upon their length of time under Social Security. So I think that's a fair point. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Representative Landwehr. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, going back to the discussion of, you know, COLAs, which CAPERS has done off and on, it's actually the wrong thing to do because 
CAPERS is a defined benefit program. And most government entities have tried to get away from those because they are very, very expensive. They don't ride the market. We are guaranteeing that when you sign up today with CAPERS and you're told you're going to get $1,000 a month, this hypothetical, you're going to get $1,000 a month, irregardless of what the market does, period. That's why COLAs don't belong on here. You do not find a defined benefit plan, and Alan can correct me if I'm wrong, in the private market. So I get a little frustrated with the, you know, the idea of having COLA because it's also right with what Rosie Francis talked about. You know, we've got to have some personal responsibility. So you have your capers, you have your social security and retirement and savings if you, you know, were able to do that or responsible enough to do that. Director, do you want to respond? Uh, I'll just comment. That's right. Uh, colas are not part of the plan plan design of capers. Um, they have to be ad hoc. The legislature has to uh, add them or provide for them. Since they're not part of the plan design, means they're not pre-funded, so it adds to the unfunded liability. And of course, there's different ways you could pay it up front or uh, pay it over uh, over time. That's right. And I'll just comment. I mean, there's some. Uh, other plans, uh, public plans, defined benefit plans that do have a built-in COLA, um, and, but some do not, and of course, CAPERS is one of those that, that does not. All right, thank you. Representative well, Blackweird, did you Mr. have another comment? Well, I think at some point, Mr. Chairman, whenever the time might allow, I think it would be good for the Appropriations Committee to get the history of why CAPERS ever got into trouble in the first place. And it wasn't all because the legislature made a decision not to properly fund it. And it goes back to, and again, I think Alan can uh, verify, is maybe 1992 when the teachers came on board, would that be right? Uh, little, uh, early 70s, but when they, the 70s. school, yep. Okay, but it was in 92 or somewhere around there a decision got made, a financial decision got made on CAPERS, and then we found out that the actuarial numbers we were working with were wrong, and that put it in a big hole. And we've been digging out of that hole forever, plus the hole that was put created when the teachers did come on board because they were upside down. And I think it'd be good to see that history so more people understand that. I'm sure Representative Helgerson's familiar with that. <laughs> Representative, make a good point. That's right. It was 1993. Significant benefit increases for retired and active members. The decision at the time was that the employer would pay for it, that it would not be sort of a cost share thing. Uh, and then so that was a big change. And then also, as Representative Landwehr points out, the actuary at the time had just made a mistake and it cost even way more than was uh, estimated initially. Representative Landwehr, did you have any more? Chairman. All right, thank you. That, no, that's it. I just think that history is important. And if I can just comment, whenever Alan's got time, I'd like to visit with him, please. All right, you can do that. Representative Estes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to Representative Wolfmore's uh, perception question, I remember a time when we were 49th in the nation. Do you remember what year that was? And you can tell. can you tell us where we are now? Uh, yes, Representative. I mean, it would have probably been uh, around that 2011, 2012, and and depending on which group, you know, kind of the rankings you went to. I mentioned 56 percent earlier, and that was around that period, 2010, 11, 12, and that's of course when the legislature uh, took some major major action. Um, uh, again, I'd say Capers has come a long way. I think, and again, depending on what you're measuring and the different groups, but I'd say like good old Kansas, we're kind of right in the middle of the pack now. Um, so we've come a long ways from, uh, you know. There used to be those kind of the bottom ones that you didn't want to be associated with, um, you know, and we were pretty close, you know, Illinois, Kentucky, and so forth that had uh, significance and still have some significant funding problems. Um, but we've, because of the efforts of the legislature, I think have, we're in sort of that mid-tier now, uh, kind of the middle of the pack. It'd be nice to know what that number is because I think it's important. It's it's a it's a great way to let people know. Hey, we've moved up in the rankings this amount of much. We're being responsible. We're going to take care of you. I think it's useful information. Representative Helgerson. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me dovetail on a little bit what was said. And you mentioned that it was previous decisions that were made, uh, some faulty information and assumptions that were made, but it was also investment policy where Capers was trying to do economic development. And it was also a conscious decision by the legislature to fund additional benefits without putting in sufficient payments so that each year we were creating a deficit, a conscious deficit funding program. Is that correct? Yes. So while I am, as you might guess, uh, completely in favor of the billion dollars or wherever we end up, I have real reservations not getting to that 80 percent. But one thing that occurred to me was, and I, and I hadn't had a chance to bounce it off of you, we could fund a billion dollars and then create, of uh, the way it was, 20 some million dollars that we would not be putting in because of the layering bill, $80 million approximately of additional amounts that would be coming in because we'd be saving. So that's an additional $100 million. Is that possible to dedicate, because that's savings that we're having, is that possible to dedicate in to putting a scenario to build in some kind of a uh, cost of living increase if that was the legislature's decision? And I'm not saying it, I'm just looking at it so that we actually don't deficit fund. By putting in a billion dollars, we have, we have prepaid, basically, for the additional benefit that we have. Is that a possibility? I'd say yes. Um, you could, and uh, just the 25 million is in the 82. So if, if the billion okay. comes under like 2561, it, it would free up 82 million a year. But yes, there could be, um, you know, that those savings then could be dedicated towards the unfunded liability or whatever the so policy. So you don't create a bigger deficit, uh, which is what we did in the uh, 80s, and, 80s and 90s in particular. Okay. Yes. I, for anybody that's interested. Thank you. All right. I'm not showing any further questions for the director, so thank you for being here this morning and giving us an update on CAPERS and what we will probably be having further discussion in regards of how we want to address the unfunded liability. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, our more budget presentations. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Chairman Sutton from the General Government Budget. So please indicate which budget you're going to start with. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, we're on a great on a great topic. So let's go ahead and do the the uh, capers budget. Now I will let the committee know that we in no way in our committee touch the uh, uh, the trust fund itself. All right, this is the nuts and bolts of making the the agency run. This is keeping the lights on, not your retirement program. So let me get that out of the way right up front. Uh, for 2022, the agency submits a revised estimate of $63 million in expenditures, 98.4 FTEs. That includes $62.2 million from the CAPERS fund. Uh, this represents an increase of $2.6 million or 4.2% above the amount approved by the 2021 re uh, legislature. The revised estimate includes an increase of $2.6 million in expenditures from the CAPERS fund uh, for investment management expenses. Okay, let me just break for a moment and say that's good news, not bad news. All right, when returns come in higher than we would expect, we pay a higher management fee for those funds. So <clears throat> while it looks like an increase in spending, it's because we're, we had a ridiculously good year investment-wise. Right, so understand that. Each year, the submitted budget assumes a 7.75% return with associated investment management expenses. Uh, when the system's investment portfolio experiences higher returns, investment-related expenses also increase. Those are the, the premiums or the commissions that we're talking about. Uh, the governor's recommendation, the governor concurs uh, with the 63.1 million and 98.4 FTEs. 
and the House Budget Committee similarly concurred. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In light of the previous budget that we went through, when we look at your FTE positions, it's 98.4. My only question is, is that FTE funded or FTE filled? Because I'm wondering if they're different budget to budget. I don't know the answer to that, so let me phone a friend. One moment. And then, and while you're looking, maybe research could respond to that because we just saw a budget in which it was not filled or, and it wasn't funded, but I've always been under the assumption that that's funded positions, but maybe it's, I don't know. And I can't answer it on this agency right, right this second. So I guess the bottom line is what are we, are we what the individual budgets, are they consistent? in how they're interpreting their FTE Representative not. Williams, I think Amy has a response to your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, those would be authorized positions, not funded positions. So, and that would vary from budget to budget, how many were funded and vary then how many of the funded were filled. Representative Williams. Okay. so. Authorized positions, and I guess then how we would interpret that, you would have to go into the meat of the budget to understand what it, what were the real FTE that were filled, and what were the FTE that. It's just a little. It gets a little fuzzy because then you have to really dig into each budget budget to figure it out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have it on very good authority that all of these positions are funded. Uh, whether they're filled varies from year to year as they lose people, gain people, so on and so forth. But all of the 98.4 positions are funded for the budget. Any further questions on 2022? Seeing none, move on to 2023. Very good. <laughs> For 2023, the agency requests 67.7 million in expenditures and 98.4 the same FTE positions. Uh, that includes 66.8 million from the CAPERS fund. This represents an increase of 4.6 million above the agency's revised estimate in 22. Uh, the request includes an increase of $2.6 million in expenditures for modernization of the pension administration system. This has been a project that's been going on for I think about four years now. Uh, we, I see it in budgets routinely on, in, for CAPERS. Uh, for fiscal year 2023, the agency has budgeted $9.2 million for the project with increased cost included for contractual expenditures with the company Sagitech as it develops the new system. Major efforts include employer web portal updates, administration system upgrades, business process management, data profiling and cleaning, and development of the member web, web portal. Uh, <coughs> the request also includes an increase of $1.8 million in expenditures from the CAPERS Fund for investment management expenses. Each year, the submitted budget assumes a 7.75% return. Although, based on last year, I really think we should probably increase it to 25. I, <laughs> not, not really. That, that, not really. Um, when the system's investment portfolio experiences higher returns, investment-related expenses also increase. They're just planning for, hopefully, another good year. Maybe that'll happen, maybe not. Uh, the governor concurs with the agency's request, and so did the House Budget Committee. Uh, we did want to, however, wait before you go. Uh, we had a proviso that was added in committee, and that was to add language allowing any member of the legislature to become a member of CAPERS, provided said member previously elected not to participate in the system. Such elections must be completed before the beginning of the 23 session. This came about due to... Uh, a, a, I do think it's a little bit of an oversight in that members elected to the legislature get one opportunity to enroll in, in CAPERS. If they don't take that, uh, no matter how long they serve, there's no longer that option. We don't have an open enrollment in CAPERS, all right? It doesn't, it's not triggered after each election, all right? You have one opportunity. Um, with the 
the state of the world currently, um, some people's living conditions have changed. And, and uh, they expressed a concern that they weren't able to get into CAPERS, but now think that maybe that's something that they should have done. And so we just wanted to provide a one-time, kind of an open enrollment uh, uh, program for legislators who had not signed up for CAPERS originally when, they, when first elected. So, in regards to that addition that was made in 2023, the wording of it is just after, or be the beginning of the 2023 session, not after any subsequent election. And correct? I, well, no, correct. Not after any subsequent election. It's not. This is not an ongoing thing. This is, and I wouldn't necessarily so, be opposed so I, to making I'm it. I'm posing an that question thing. because. If there's a situation that arises, say, after the start of the session in 2029, yep. this would not apply. This would not apply. Um, Obviously, because it's also in the budget. Exactly. So, uh, we didn't feel real comfortable. Uh, that was discussed. Um, we didn't feel real comfortable with using a proviso to implement a long-term change in the process. I would be very comfortable with legislation uh, that that said after each election is, you know, you have that option. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Estes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a question for the chair, and I don't know if it may end up getting answered over here. Does this proviso treat the elected person differently than we treat other state employees. I would assume other state employees get to opt in each year when they do their benefits. Are they given a one-shot deal also? So we would be treating an elected person differently than we treat our other employees. Reminder that when we are on budgets, the questions are directed to the chairperson. I apologize. Thank and you. And then the chairperson answers. So Chairman Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not fully aware of, for every occupation, whether there are opportunities or not. I do know that if, like say for example, a teacher goes from one district to another, they'll have that opportunity to en enroll in, in CAPERS. Um, if a legislator goes from one committee to another, they don't have that option. If, if that, or one side of the building to the other that option is not available. Thank you. Representative Hoffman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that was kind of the same question I was. Uh, so if a state employee is employed for five, six years, and then they, they quit for a while or, or let off, or, and then, they, then they're rehired, are are they allowed to come back if they if, let's say that they didn't they didn't uh, have capers before mm -hmm. can they elect to get capers then it's my understanding that they can okay so so i, I guess it kind of depends on how we want to look at it i mean every time we're elected we are elected for a new position i mean we're sworn in again so i i i think we could probably justify that if it's after allowed every time we're elected. I'm not sure we'd want to allow every year for them to be, you know, say, no, I don't want to. Yes, I do. And everything. Right. So, um, I don't know, <laughs> kind of, uh, <laughs> that, that was the other part of the, of the wicket that we uh, didn't really want to necessarily address in our budget committee. That's why we just wanted to do a one time at this point, that legislation though would have to have some details hammered out. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the arguments that I heard I thought was pretty uh, uh, compelling uh, was that none of us ever intended to be here this long. <laughs> no. Well, okay, okay yeah, you might have, but, but nobody else did. <laughs> Representative Wolfmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple questions. So um, do we know how many um, this affects, how many led? No idea. Okay, and then, so I assume, for example, if I didn't sign up for, I'm here five years in the legislature, then I just, we do this and I sign up. I don't get credit for those years that I didn't sign up. 
There was discussion on that. It, it seems like there is some mechanism for buying years of service, yeah, true. Uh, but you, you wouldn't automatically get credit for those extra that, years, no. That's good. And then this is just a question. Um, wh why do people not originally sign up for it in the legislature? It comes from a, a couple of different things. I think some of our, our younger members don't ever think that they are going to retire. Um, and, and then I, I think in a lot of cases, people didn't expect to be here any period of time. And maybe they got surprised or addicted or lost their minds. And they're here, all of the above. And here they are. <laughs> OK, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Representative Helgerson. Well, it, it, being an individual that's gone out and come back and come back and retired and whatever, um, and also uh, an individual, and I can say this, that uh, when I was part of the system, there were two systems, and one was considered to be overly generous, and one was considered to be the basic. I can tell you, when you start doing individual policies for legislators or for a legislator, you will hear about in the general public for a long time to come. Now, so I have some reservations, but I also, this was a proviso. Did the, did Capers get a chance to get their, uh, give a presentation to you about how they would suggest uh, something should be done? Not exactly like that. Uh, uh, Director Conroy was available for questions when we were discussing that that point, however. Okay. That's why I knew some of the answers. I appreciate it. Um, while I have a reservation with this proviso or this recommendation, the reason we want people to be part of CAPERS is because we want more better qualified individuals, not only as state legislators, but as public employees, and one thing I heard from a lot of people is, we're gonna have problems recruiting people in the future. Uh, and I think that we need to make our system better and give them more of an opportunity to be part of the family. And so I don't think we should do it individually, but I think we should introduce a broader base and ask the capers to come back and give us a recommendation about how we can get something implemented soon or this session, but not just do it for legislators or not just do it for a legislator. So. I would support that legislation, uh, but I also will support the proviso that our budget committee came out with. Reverend Helgerson, did you have any more questions or are you awaiting a response? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, was I supposed to respond? No, no. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not using spark funds. So. <laughs> Can't use spark funds yeah, for the retirement system. Uh, I would make a motion that we take this out. Uh, and then I, and that we substitute, and I don't have anything written because I didn't know this was coming up, but that we visit with the agency about how we can get something implemented still in this report, still in this year, to help this, and I don't know who the legislator is, to help the legislator or legislators, and if we need a broader policy for CAPERS. All right, committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Estes. Discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any discussion. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. The last Chair. Moment. Uh, yeah, I slow played that one. Um, I, th I think uh, it's well-intentioned. Uh, I, I, I think that the motion is well-intentioned. And I, like I said, I would support uh, that legislation. I am concerned that uh, uh, we're kind of hanging it on a prayer uh, as far as will this legislation ever come to fruition and get passed. Um, I hope it does. But uh, until that time, I would... I would uh, uh, oppose the measure just because I want the proviso to stay in place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Johnson. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, a couple of thoughts in, in general on it. And then 
as we look to the proviso, as we've talked earlier, we'd, we'd have a chance to revisit either way um, to, to change and add or, or, or take out. So I think it's a useful discussion for us to start. Um, I believe, as if I may ask for whichever the maker of the motion or who would know, I think if I join the plan at this point, I would always and only be in tier three. Is that correct? That, that is correct. So that is the tier that I would be in. And as I understand that, there would not be a financial impact to CAPERS. Any service purchases would be cost neutral. That would be, uh, so that's not the concern. It would be the consistency between how we treat all employees. And if there's any concern with CAPERS and the consistency of their policy, whether that runs afoul of tax issues or whatever else it could. Um, and if we if we know that those issues are settled through the discussion that you are having, then I, I think it's a matter of, of timing when we actually want to have it in consideration of the budget. It, is there a concern on the taxation of the plan at all? There, no, there was none expressed whatsoever. So uh, the with ability to the IRS capers is, is flexible. On Correct. That. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ballard. Thank you. Then the clarification: If we if we pass this, then what did you say about? I'm sorry, I had to make a quick stop. But oh, that's fine. The, what would happen with a, uh, a a person just coming into Capers too that didn't do it, and three years later decided they wanted to do? What did we cite? Would we would this cover them as well, or only just this specific case? Okay. Okay. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. <laughs> In other words, if we say that the individual can't, or whoever, mm -hmm. who didn't do it initially can well, come in. Right. Okay, so someone that's not a legislator, if they didn't, do they have to automatically sign up for CAPERS, or can they decline? Chairman Sutton. I think anyone has the option of declining. Okay, so they didn't do it for two years, but now uh, they I want to come in. I believe, Jill, did you want to clarify that? I don't think you can drop out of CAPERS if that's what you're they, asking. Like regular state employees cannot decline CAPERS. We're automatically oh. enrolled in it. Okay. See, that was what... I the, was not aware of that. Was the, I thought that was it, but I wasn't sure. So it's not discriminating against them because they have to do it initially. I just wanted right. to make sure because otherwise I think we would have someone saying, well, if they can do it, we should be able to do it. And that's what I was just trying to clarify. That's that's valid. No, I, I didn't realize that state employees automatically well, I were it was, but I wasn't that, sure either. That's interesting. All right. Thank All right. you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions or comments in regards to the motion that we have right now? Representative Estes. I, I appreciate that that was clarified because that my concern fundamentally was that we treat an elected official differently than we treat employees. So if we are not giving someone preferential treatment, I don't, I don't have as much of an issue with, with the proviso. I won't withdraw my second out of courtesy <laughs> right, to I'm to the it. amendment <laughs> to, to the amendment but but I, I am much more comforted comforted knowing that we're not giving preferential treatment. Any other questions in regards to the motion? Seeing none, Representative Helgerson, you may close. I understand there's reservations. I'll tell you a brief you don't want to put some I, I, again, I have no idea who this is or if there's more than one. You do not want to do this individually for an elected official. Elected official. I don't know if they're running for re-election or not. You don't want to hang this on them so that the, uh, either, uh, either the Democrats or the Republicans use this as a campaign issue against them. And you want to have the agency come back with a recommendation, and I'll be happy to introduce a proviso on the big bill to make sure that we can take care of these people, person or people, but don't do it for one person. It's just not, it's just not good policy, I don't think. And that's why I, I'm trying to defend the policy, but get it taken care of for a broader group if that's what we need to. I move the motion. All right, I was going to ask you, are you going to move the motion? <laughs> right. Thank you. All right, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The no's appear to have it. No's do have it. Motion fails. We're back on the budget. Uh, Representative Tarwater. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, question in regards to the $9.2 million for the modernization of the pension administration system. How, specifically, how the decision was made, was it a no-bid contract for $9.2 million, or was there an RFP done, or how did that process work? Now, I'm, I'm reviewing a handout that I don't have with me right this second, but, oh, thank you. <laughs> Analyst woo, this guy, I'll tell you. But there was, there was an RFP, as I recall. This has been going on for a couple, at least two years, and I think it was actually more than that since we started talking about it. Um, in 2020, Capers engaged in a request for a proposal for a complete business assessment of Capers. Uh, at that time, they came up with the fact that, oh, by the way, this is an outdated system. I believe it's on page nine. Yes, this is on page nine. In uh, 2021, Sagitech uh, completed the proof of concept project, and Capers elected to retain Sagitech as the project vendor. Um, this is, this is uh, a pretty extensive overhaul, as you may imagine, uh, with these funds. This is a, uh, uh, there are a lot of moving parts as far as the software system is involved, uh, so, so or is, is concerned. Um, so there's a lot of customization that's required. This is, this is not a one-day project. This is something that's been in development for uh, at least a couple of years, and it's been being discussed for four. Senator Tarwater. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any ongoing cost after the $9.2 million? With any soft, uh, not that's reflected in the budget right now, with any software, any any uh, uh, hardware software uh, changes, you can expect that. But we don't we don't have that data yet, and it's not included in any of these budgets because it's not online yet. Can I, Representative Tarwater? Mr. Chairman, the reason I'm asking this is because, as you know, we set up the Modernization Council for the uh, Department of Labor to to revamp their unemployment system. <clears throat> and there was an RFB, RFP that was done previous to the signing of the bill, which kind of threw a big wrench into how we could look at things. In fact, we never really got to meet with the four companies that responded to the RFP because it was confidential in nature. Um, those, uh, right, so the Employment that Council that- <laughs> There's a lot of that going around. Right. Uh, <laughs> However, we did bring some other companies in to look at their systems. One of them was Geographic Solutions. And they have a product that would have worked, and it was only $3.5 million to, to buy, to have. Uh, to add tax, it was another $2 million, I believe. Uh, and to add the pension plan, it was almost nothing. And we don't, our departments don't seem to be communicating with each other because there are companies out there with off-the-shelf programs that are much less expensive than not. You could have gotten the whole darn thing for $9 million. Could have fixed everybody's problem. Um, I just think in the future we need to take a real close look at this. And I know that the vice chair is, uh, is on the JIT. He's the chairman of the JIT committee. And I, I think that any future product, project like this needs to be run through that committee so that we can tie them all together. I mean, we're wasting, I don't know who they went with. Supposedly, they made a choice on a vendor for the modernization program of the Department of Labor. And that was several months ago, or two, at least two months ago. And they still haven't contracted with them. We still don't know who it is. We don't know how much it's going to be. It's a debacle. And so, I, just, I guess we've already signed a contract with this company, so there's really nothing we can do. But right. it's this really kind of idiotic how we do things around here. We need to take a closer look at it. I, I second that emotion. Um, the, uh, what we ran into here, because obviously when you see modernization, I was automatically thinking, you know, hey, let's give it to Spark. But uh, uh, this, this was approved legislatively a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, the, the modernization project itself, the RFP was already out and, and approved prior to any of this stuff developing. This is one of those that we just started modernizing a little bit before it was cool, and that's the reason that it, it wasn't included in some of these other projects. Just wish it would have 
Sagitech was a, was one of the companies that bid on the other product. I don't know if we ended up with them or not. It's still confidential, but maybe they did, and maybe they could just plug them in together, and maybe it's a better deal. But who knows? Um, in my opinion, we didn't go with Sagitech because of the way the RFP was written was very specific to one company, and that one company usually is very expensive, like in the thirties thirty million dollar range. And so I'm anxious to see who they contract with and how much it is. And maybe it is Sagitech, and maybe they blended them all together and they made it work, but they don't tell us anything like yeah, that. So I, I didn't, didn't sign that NDA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Landwehr. That was actually on a, uh, another issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. I'm not seeing any further questions. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just have one point of clarification that I, I would ask. Um, in the, I think it's the contractual services line where we would see the payment for the investment performance, which is great. I'm wondering if 2021 is arbitrarily low, given that we had two really poor quarters in 2020, and maybe that one's not reflective, but was just wondering if there was a way to get a little more context between that, because other than those quarters, the prior years also had some pretty good returns, and um, wondering if it just happens to be a timing piece that comes out. So that was that was kind of my understanding that it was just the, the reporting, you know, the reporting date was is what kind of skewed that. And yeah, Alan's nodding at me. I think we're I think we're on the same page here. Uh, that it was it was just a matter of the timing of the the down quarters so, so thank you I might ask if if there is a possibility just to get a little more information maybe looking back a little farther and and the detail of how that runs through and then how that also bleeds over and whether we pay it if we pay quarterly and we project that into 2023 how the timing of those payments might work with the the, the amount that's there I would love to get that information for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Tarwater. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, okay. back, to, back to my previous conversation, I'm looking at, at what was handed to me as far as the modernization. It appears that we spent, was it, $6.6 .6 million in 21 on the modernization, and we're budgeted for 9.2 for 23. 9.2 for 24 or 9 million for 24. What did this project cost? I'm afraid I'm going to have to get back to you on that one because I don't have the total figure here in front of me. I mean, it's looking like this alone was $30 million and who knows what it's going to be going forward. I mean, we, if it's going to be like that, we need to cancel the damn contract and tie it in with the modernization of the rest of our, uh, the rest of the other offices. Yeah, I'm going to have to get back with you on that information because I don't have it. That would be great. Thank you. Any further questions for Chairman Sutton? Seeing none, Chairman Sutton. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that lively discussion, I would like to move the uh, House Budget Committee report for uh, the CAPERS system, tw years 2022 and 2023, uh, as discussed. I, I guess it wasn't amended. There so was never no mind. I was going so. to say as amended, but it was not. All right, Committee, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second by Representative uh, Helgerson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Eyes appear to have it. Eyes do have it. Motion passes. Okay, we have about five minutes before session starts, and I know uh, it's pro forma, but um, there is a uh, point of personal privilege that, that some may want to get to. I did, since we have a quorum here today, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, um, and I did want to work um, House Bill 2591. And if you remember, this is the pretty much one sentence to repeal conflicting language that was passed in House Bill 2022 regarding the abandoned oil and gas well funds and combining those with language that was inserted in the budget where the KCC says that they are not able to combine those funds. And so I move that we pass House Bill 2591 favorably for passage. 
and uh, it is seconded by Representative Estes. And Halverson. Is there any discussion on the motion? There has been discussion about having it on the consent calendar, um, but as we had mentioned in our chairman's luncheons, that when you have pro forma days, that could actually extend the three days on the consent calendar, so that's why I'm not making a motion to put it on the consent calendar. Seeing no further discussion, I will move my motion to pass out House Bill 2591. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, so for tomorrow, we are going to um, have the Kansas Human Rights Commission and the Office of Administrative Hearings from Chairman Sutton, also the legislative branch budgets that I'm going to be presenting tomorrow, and then we'll have uh, Representative Francis with the transportation and public safety budgets. So until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we are adjourned. Thank you.